Welcome to the Feast of Tabernacles 2021. I hope everyone is enjoying the feast, wherever it is in the world that you are right now. Uh, this sermon is being pre-recorded, and uh, so far everything is looking pretty good. It looks like we're going to be able to, uh, to come together for the feast, so that's pretty awesome, uh, especially considering, you know, last year and, well, even this year, some aren't going to be able to, but um, I was one of those that wasn't able to attend last year because of COVID. But uh, this year, you know, like I said, if everything goes to plan, I'll be there, or here, I guess I should say. And um, yeah, we just got to remember that, uh, you know, things are going to be getting a lot worse out there. And uh, in the time that remains, that whenever we can get together, hopefully we're all able to, to take full advantage of that uh, to be in fellowship. Um, doing this recording here in this new little studio setup, and this is uh, a first for me, it's kind of strange. Uh, the room is quite dark and there are some giant lamps here. Um, one of them is a couple feet across. It's very bright. So if you can imagine being in a dark room and having somebody shine flashlights um, in your eyes, that's kind of what I'm experiencing right now. So if you see me uh, squinting at some point here uh, when I look up, that's probably why because I don't know. Ho hopefully my eyes adjust. So we'll see how this goes. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, jump right into the sermon this morning. The title of today's sermon is Growing in Favor Through Trust. Growing in Favor Through Trust. It's important that as we move forward in time uh, that we have a close relationship with God. Uh, we want Him on our sides at all times because what we're about to enter, like I was just saying, um, is going to make COVID look like such a cakewalk. Reading through the first chapter of this new book, it really brings home uh, how much shock this world is really in for and how ugly things are going to get. The world is going to be brought to humility and we're going to be along for, for the ride. We are going to be tested and when that time comes, we want God to be able to fight our battles for us. We are going to want him fully on our side. So today we're going to look at how we can make sure that we are close to him and what we need to do to guarantee that it stays like that. We're going to look more in depth into what grace and faith are all about. And we're going to see how they play such an important role in God's plan for his family, especially at this momentous time when the millennium arrives and God begins to work with a much larger number of people. And grace and faith are two words that I don't particularly like. Now, the world has so abused them, and sometimes, if we aren't careful, uh, some of the notions can taint our own understanding. And if not taint, then at least they can take away or hide the true meaning of what the, the words are really about. And for those of you who are uh, part of the Worldwide Church of God, I'm sure you know what I mean uh, when you just look at you know, what the church was renamed to, Grace Communion. So that should make us yeah, want to throw up, and yeah, it's just so much syrupy, sweet fakeness. It's pretty disgusting. But anyway, let's start out here by looking at how the word grace is used in Scripture in the Old Testament. Interestingly enough, uh, the word for grace in Hebrew was translated 38 times as grace and 26 times as favor. Uh, so that shows already how these words are very similar. Let's look at the first instance of when it was used um, in the Old Testament with that of Noah. So if you'll turn over with me to Genesis 6, and we're going to go to verse 7. That's Genesis 6 and verse 7. So we all know the story here. Um, mankind became wicked, and they're evil in all their ways. And then we you know, come to verse 7 here, and it says, So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And we know that this word here um, for sorry uh, isn't really the, necessarily the, the, the best uh, uh, translation. A lot of times, you know, it says even regretted it, and we know that God didn't actually regret it. Um, but it's interesting, this word actually just means, uh, the, the root of it in Hebrew just means to sigh deeply. So you can imagine, you know, seeing God and seeing what was taking place on the earth and just letting out a big sigh, you know, like, like really, it's sad to see, but um, yeah, that's what was happening. 
So in verse 8 it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And in verse 9 uh, it says, This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. So because Noah walked with God, he found grace in his eyes. He found favor. And he and his family, as we know, were safe from the flood. Let's look at another verse real quick here. Uh, let's turn over to Numbers 11, and we'll go to verse 11. So that's Numbers 11 and verse 11. And it says, So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant, and why have I not found favor in your sight, that you have laid the burden of all of these people on me? So here Moses is basically complaining that he has to work with far too many people. And so he's asking God, have I not found favor in your sight? Like, what are you doing to me here? And if I have, then please give me some help. And that's exactly what God did in this instance, as we know. So anyway, we see that these translations, you know, whether it says favor or grace, it's the same word that's, that was used in the Hebrew, and they're used interchangeably. And we don't know, need to, uh, to go through every instance here. Um, but what these two examples do show is how grace and favor are used in almost all the instances uh, in the Old Testament. And that is, it's used in conjunction with finding it um, in somebody's sight or their eyes. And in the vast majority of cases, it's often referring to God. So you have these expressions, if I have found favor in your sight or if I have found favor in your eyes, and in fact, uh, the word is not really used outside of this context uh, very often. And I started to count through, and I saw that the first uh, 49 of the 69 times that it's used in the Old Testament, it's used in this combination. And it's used some more afterwards, but I just got tired of counting. Um, but you get the picture. So this expression is very similar to how we speak today when we say, um, you know, if somebody has, uh, if someone's in someone's good graces. And that means basically that you're in one's favor, that you've earned their approval or regard. So based on this expression, we can see how those in the Old Testament were constantly seeking God's approval. And in the Old Testament, it was based on their obeying what God commanded. We know that until Abraham, only a few people walked side by side with God, like we just read about uh, Noah as well. But afterwards, uh, God began to work with the physical nation. The Israelites were God's special people. In other words, they were favored by God. Um, they were favored far more above any other people on the earth. And that special relationship began with Abraham and through his obedience and trust in God. And the physical Israelites were able to receive favor from God because of Abraham's actions. Abraham earned God's approval. That doesn't mean that Abraham was perfect by any means. But God looks to the heart, and he saw Abraham's heart was in the right place. God recognizes that we are handicapped, so to say, and he built something into us that fights against his way of life. That is where God's mercy comes into play, because he has to show us mercy because the wages of sin is death. So we see that God gives out his favor as a help. All of these scriptures in the Old Testament speak to that. Uh, the writers understand that they need God's help, and they are constantly seeking it. They want to have his favor, his grace. And they know that the, at the same time, uh, that God, the almighty, ever-existing one, is not obliged to give it to us. Those few that were worked with in the Old Testament are always seeking God's grace and favor. They understood that to sin is to go against God. And if you go against somebody, why would they give you favor? So they really understood that what they were asking from God was a lot, because everyone sins, no one's perfect. And that's why they always use this type of speech that makes them sound small, like, hearken your ear unto me. Um, and this is like a, a sort of a plea to God, begging him basically to have mercy and consider their petitions. This is the only way that God would listen to them, and they were showing humility. Now let's look a little bit deeper into this word for favor and grace that's used in the Old Testament. Favor, of course, is a noun, and uh, in the Hebrew, um, it's H-E-N, uh, I believe they pronounce it Chaim. Uh, sounds kind of Dutch. Um, 
But there's another version of the, uh, of the same uh, word that's used as a verb, um, and it's uh, hanan, H-A-N-A-N. And what's interesting about this verb is that it literally means uh, to bend or to stoop. And this is where you can start to have a little bit of a additional, or see a little bit of additional meaning um, in the word that comes into play. Because what are you doing if you bend or stoop to someone? Well, it's a way of showing humility. We don't really use grace in its verb form. So usually in, when it's translated into English, it's translated as to be gracious or to be dealt with graciously. Um, and sometimes even as making supplication. And that last one is very interesting. Um, let me read a definition real quick of uh, supplication. It says, supplication is a form of prayer wherein one party humbly or earnestly asks another party to provide something, either for the party who is doing the supplicating, for example, uh, please spare my life, or on behalf of someone else. So in other words, to ask for favor or grace also means to ask it in a humble and earnest manner. Uh, the verb of grace is sometimes translated even as to have pity. And maybe that's not the best translation, but I think it shows you know, that level of humility that the word also contains. If you ask somebody, you know, please have pity on me, can mean please have mercy on me because you know, I am what I am. And that's very much how we should be with our attitude with God as well. We are stuck in these carnal bodies and we must try to overcome. But of course, you know, we're gonna have times when we fall on our face. And so we need to ask God basically to you know, understand and that this is how we are, and, and, and please, uh, you know, uh, to, you know, see us for, for what we are as these weak, carnal human beings, and that are, to show him as well that our hearts are in the right place. But this idea of coming before someone in a stooping manner or bending down, as I mentioned a moment ago, is it's, it's showing hum humility, and it's showing that you recognize that there is a difference in levels. And we ask God for favor, it must always be with humility. And if we don't ask with a humble uh, attitude, then God will not work with us, and he sure won't give us his favor. And that's a huge point that we need to take note of, because it is exactly what happened with Satan and the demons. Their attitude changed, and they raised themselves up. Um, they thought they were greater than God, and they forgot that there's a difference in positions, and that they are not on the same level as God Almighty. So if we think we're something great, that of course can be dangerous for God if he were to give us more favor. So he won't, it's just that simple. You could say in general that humility is needed to receive of God's favor. Now that doesn't mean that if you're humble, God will work with you automatically. There are plenty of downtrodden and poor individuals in the world that have a humble spirit and yet God is not working with them and has not, that's not been part of his plan in the past 6,000 years. But I can tell you that of those people that God has called, at least at the point of their calling, uh, they weren't cocky and they weren't arrogant because if that were the case, God would not be able to work with them. Let's take a look at how uh, this verb for grace and favor is sometimes used. Um, I've got an example here we're gonna check out in Esther 4 and verse 8. Esther 4 and verse 8. So just a refresh in case we've forgotten. Um, Haman is trying to have all the Jews in the kingdom killed. And Mordecai, who is Esther's uh, cousin, goes to her and he's telling her, you got to go before the king and you got to try to get this fixed. So right now we're going to jump into uh, to the story here in Esther 4 and verse 8. And it says, Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, and showed it to Esther, and to declare it to her, and to charge her that she should go unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make requests before him to her people. So take note of this little section there where it says, to make supplication to him. Uh, the verb uh, form of grace is, is what's actually being used here. So Esther is being told to make supplication unto the king 
and to make a, a special request to get this decree thrown out. Uh, like I mentioned just a bit ago, unfortunately for us it's very strange to uh, use the word um, in this verb form um, in English. And so the translations, you know, they usually just throw in to make, uh, to give it action. And in English, um, it would also sound strange if we said, you know, to make favor. Um, so they put in uh, supplication in this place for a favor. And in this case, the word supplication is carrying some of that meaning uh, that the word favor or grace for us in English is actually lacking. And that missing part, again, is about bending down and having humility. I really like this example uh, because it's clear for us to see that, you know, if you're going before a king, well, you usually have to bow or literally get on your knee. Um, and so that's a good way to visualize this attitude. So Esther was going before the king full of humility uh, when she was petitioning him. And asking for favor, she should be demonstrating a humble spirit. Esther was really needing to demonstrate humility to the king so that he would hopefully hear her petition. And that's really the fuller meaning of how the, the word is used in Hebrew here. There are plenty of other examples I could go into, but I don't think there's much point in it. Uh, we just need to keep in mind that favor or grace and humility go hand in hand. Uh, you can't go asking for favor without having a humble spirit and expect to receive any. Uh, think about it with any other example in life where you might ask someone for their favor. If you are arrogant and you don't have a humble spirit, you won't get very far. So, so far we've seen how grace and favor worked in the Old Testament. And uh, now let's go ahead and take a look at how things progressed into the New Testament. If you turn over with me to John 1 and verse 14. That's John 1 and verse 14. We'll pick things up there. John 1 and verse 14 it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we know that Christ received a massive amount of favor from God the Father, uh, beginning from when he was first born. Christ had the truth, and he knew it at a very young age. And we know that when he was a kid, he was dumbfounding scholars of the time. If we think about Abraham from earlier, he also received a massive amount of God's favor. And because of that, he was able to have his seed blessed above all others on the earth. And the physical nation of Israel came from him. This allowed for God's plan to further develop. But for that stretch in time, it was primarily physical. Let's skip down to uh, verse 17. Verse 17, it says, For the law was given to Moses, but grace and the truth came by Joshua Christ. So this scripture shows the maturation of God's plan. Uh, yes, God gave the law to Moses to then give to the people, but Moses could only deliver those laws to the people by showing them and telling them what they were. He couldn't give them any more favor to help them to actually keep these laws. He couldn't place the truth in their minds of the Israelites. Uh, the method for delivering God's truth was totally limited in that aspect. But now, with Christ, everything changed. He came and died for our sins. This opened up the way to make it possible uh, for more to have God's favor. And God began to be able to show those he was working with way more favor than he did to those of physical Israel. Now we're able to have Christ living in us and have God's law come into our minds. I touched on that uh, last year at the feast about how we're able to have, begin to have uh, God's law written in our hearts. And Christ showed that that overriding law is to love one another as he loved us. And as we know, that's agape love, godly love. And if we have that, then we really don't even need to bother with the other Ten Commandments uh, because they're basically all covered. Um, agape is that overriding law, and it's all about relationships. So look at that scripture again. See how much favor and opportunity um, the church has been offered at this time. 
and think about how blessed you are to partake in that favor at this time, uh, when so very few have been offered uh, what you have been offered. This is not something that we should take for granted or take it lightly because we know what Christ had to endure to make it all possible. Now, not everyone in the church is being prepared to be part of the 144,000, but some are, of course. And um, I don't know if anybody's ever done the math just to consider how very few 144,000 people are uh, throughout man's 6,000 years on earth. If you were to just you know, take uh, 6,000 and divide it um, by the 144,000, then you would get 24 people per year. So if it were strictly a yearly harvest and you had the same amount of people every year, then there would only be 24 people per year that would become part of the 144,000. And if you were born in that 6,000 year time period, then your odds are pretty small. I'm not saying this to, uh, to discourage anyone, of course, but the reality is that 144,000 is a really tiny number. And you could look at it another way. If you were just to take um, 7.9 billion people, which is the Earth's population as, as of today, and you're to say all of the 144,000 were to come from those that are living today, which of course we know is not the case, but just for example's sake, if you were to do that, then you would have about a one in almost 55,000 chance of becoming part of this group of people. So just to put that into perspective, I was curious of like, you know, what would it be, how likely are you to get struck by lightning? And um, the National Weather Service estimates that you have about a 1 in 15,000 chance of getting struck by lightning in your lifetime. So just by that statistic alone, that means that being part of the 144,000 from today's population, 7.9 billion, uh, means that you are more than three times more likely to be struck by lightning than you would to become a part of the 144,000. And that's not even taking into consideration, of course, all the people who has ever lived you know, for the thousands of years before. So again, these statistics shouldn't discourage anyone, but instead, um, you should consider how special um, that our calling really is. Um, even if you haven't been called to be part of the 144,000, but instead to live on to the millennium, you're still very blessed. Um, you have a huge head start over everybody else in the world right now. So we should take some time and maybe just think about that a little bit during the feast of, you know, how, how grateful are we for that? And, um, and we should be grateful for it. And we should be grateful that God has offered us what he has and that he's shown us the favor that he is showing us now. Let's turn over to Acts. We're going to go over to Acts 15 and verse 11. It's Acts 15 and verse 11. says, but we believe that through the grace of our Lord Joshua Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So again, this is saying much the same thing again, but it's through Christ that we can receive of God's favor, his spirit that can live within us. Without that, we have no chance for salvation. Uh, let's skip over to um, a few pages over in Acts to uh, chapter 20, and we'll look at verse 24. That's Acts 20 and verse 24. That says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Joshua to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So Luke here is talking about his job as a minister, which is to testify to the gospel, the good news about the grace of God. In other words, the good news about God's favor. That favor was starting to be offered to the church. Uh, God was giving his spirit through Christ to anyone who would become a part of the church. No longer was it just limited to physical, a physical nation, but everyone had now had the opportunity to become a part of spiritual Israel. Everyone in the church, that is. And that's some good news, obviously. Uh, just think how it's going to change uh, once again when the millennia is here. Um, the church is about to grow like it's never grown before. And that's what the 144,000 have been prepared for. They're going to be priests um, of God in Christ, as it says in, in Revelation. And there's going to be much more of Elohim 
to go around and to help expand God's plan for mankind. Let's turn over to uh, 2 Peter. I'm going to look at 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 17. That's 2 Peter 3 and verse 17. It says, You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Joshua Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So Peter's telling us here that we must grow in grace. So what does that actually mean? Well, it means that if we are steadfast in our beliefs and if we don't falter, that God will continue to give us more favor. He will pour out more of his spirit on us. And is there a greater favor from God that you could possibly receive than to have his spirit dwelling in your life to help guide you? He can help us with any battles that we come up against. And that's why the scripture says, you know, if he's for us, who can be against us? Paul is really telling us here to take advantage of what God is offering to those in the church. Uh, we can seek God's favor, and then through the pouring out of his spirit, we can grow it in knowledge. Again, this is what the gospel of grace is all about that we just read about. Paul is admonishing us here to grow in grace, and it's also interesting because it implies that we can do something to grow in God's favor. And that's totally true. We can. Traditional Christianity likes to to think that these concepts are static, that grace is just something that God gives for free, and that that's the end of the story, basically. But what we're being told here is we're being told to grow in grace, and it shows that there must be a change, i.e. going from less grace to more grace. Well, that is where you know, we find out that it is merit-based, that we must show fruit, uh, we must grow. And if you aren't um, then that grace, that favor, won't be growing. Uh, let's see what else Paul has to say about uh, how uh, grace has worked in his life. Um, and we'll turn over to see an example in 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to look at verse uh, 10. So that's 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. And it says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God was with me. Now this verse perfectly explains a balanced understanding of how God's favor works. Paul recognized that, it's, that by God's spirit living in him, he is who he is. Uh, that by the grace of God, I am what I am. In other words, he wouldn't have been able to grow uh, to be where he is without God's favor. Without that favor, he would be just like the world, not having access to his spirit. And then he says that God's grace toward him was not in vain, but that he took full advantage of that favor that God gave him. You know, plenty of people uh, through time have been given favor by God and have had the opportunity to enter into the church. But so many of them have left. The favor that God showed them did not grow. And that initial favor that God gave them was, in that sense, in vain. They didn't grasp a hold of it, and they didn't take advantage. And Paul says, on the contrary, that he did. It was not in vain. He goes on to say that he labored more than the rest, but that the result of his labor was not of his doing, but of God's favor. So how can that be? Well, it was this favor that he received from God that was able to work through him. That's what made him what he was, and, and that is a spiritual help. He is giving all the credit back to God here, and he recognizes what he was without God. In verse 9, he talks about how he persecuted the church. Well, let's take a look at that real quick. He said, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul, he had to have an awful remorse for, for that. He was very aware of what he was without God. And once he was called and given God's favor, I can only imagine how hard he would have worked, um, always thinking about what he had done in the back of his mind. Now, 
he just mentioned how he was the least of the apostles and saying how he worked harder than them all. And he had a lot farther to go in many aspects uh, than, than, than the other apostles did. I mean, to go from being an enemy of God to uh, being one of the apostles uh, was one of the, the largest change that happened to any of them. The others didn't persecute the church. Now, some may read verse 10 and, and think that because he was giving God all the glory, that it was only because of God, meaning that it, it was out of Paul's control. But that's not the whole truth in what he's saying here. Um, it was indeed in his control. Otherwise, he would not mention how much he had labored. Uh, what he's really saying is that God blessed him with more favor because he worked so much. But that favor that came from God as a result is what brought his increase. We need to be balanced in how we look at how this process works. Uh, there is work from our side that is needed, and the glory goes back to God. But both parties enjoy the success. Both parties work. Just look at what Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. Let's turn over there real quick. It's 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. He says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that plants anything, nor he that waters, but God that gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So we see our, our contribution is, is clearly needed. And... This scripture gives further insight into what Paul was saying later in chapter 15 of Corinthians. We can recognize work that we have done. Um, there's nothing wrong in that. Uh, Paul says that he planted and Apollos watered. That's just a fact. But we need to have a humble attitude about it and recognize uh, that the results that come from it are because of God. Because when you get down to it, everything is from God. You can build something and it comes out great, but where did all the materials come from? Who created them to even make whatever physical thing you built? Yeah, they all come from God. In some ways, understanding this will give insight into how God's government works. God is on top, and that's always. And that is how it must be forever into the future, because we're going to build some amazing things in the God family, and we really have no comprehension and what happens when you make something awesome? You think, oh, I'm so amazing. Uh, look what I did. And I'm sure that's exactly what Satan did as well. And he forgot that the building blocks, or the Legos, you could say, uh, that were used, that those were all manufactured by God. And we have to always give praise back to God. It's a matter of understanding our position in the government. In God's family, no one will ever be allowed to be lifted up uh, with pride. The world has not looked to God as the creator of everything. And they're all lifted up with such great pride now. And the world doesn't even have God in their thoughts. It doesn't give them the credit or the glory that is due. And that's why the US is going to be one of the first nations here to fall, because it has been given so much and it has not listened. And it's been lifted up with pride, and it's forgotten that everything does come from God. We think that we're so great because we have all this technology that we have today, but the reality is, that we just found a large deposit of dead prehistoric animals uh, and dinosaurs that were covered with sand for millions of years. And then they were buried deeper and deeper, and eventually, through great heat and pressure, it turned into oil. And so we have oil, and something that we can burn. And if you think about it, how advanced is that really? Is it really any more advanced than just burning wood? We just happened to find a huge stockpile of it. And it's allowed us to do everything that we do today. And I mean everything. It's essentially free energy that we've received. And we tend to think that, you know, oftentimes that it's only for transportation, as in, you know, the gas that we use to fill up our cars. But it touches everything that makes our modern life possible. And so we've forgotten that where does the oil come from, you know? Um, and most of, uh, most of the, the estimates that they have for how old this is, the oil is, it's comes up to be around 100 million years old. So just thinking about how long it's taking for that oil to be created um, and so that we can use it now, I mean, that should really humble us and to show us how small and how limited we are. Because 
it's difficult for us to even grasp how long 100 million years is, let alone the process and everything uh, that it went through to be able to become you know, something that we can actually use today. And now, after we've had this great stockpile of free energy, we've become dependent on it. We've become dependent on burning it. And we've been choking the entire planet, uh, polluting it. And so now there's a lot of people that, you know, they think we're just going to automatically and quickly switch over to green energies. But we still can't figure out how to get anywhere near the amount of energy uh, that we presently get from burning oil. And we're so far off. And we haven't really even spent too much time uh, thinking of alternatives to burning oil in these past 100 plus years. So with this new green energy, um, we might be able to produce a fraction of the energy that we do from oil. But how is it really going to work? Um, are you going to tell people that they can only drive a fraction of what they do now? That they can only use the AC for a fraction of the time? Or are you going to charge people uh, what the real price of food would be if it was produced without burning oil? And if you did that, no one would be able to buy any of the comforts that they enjoy in this modern world. Uh, no disposable income for video games or the latest iPhone. And the truth is, um, if there wouldn't be a third world war coming and with Christ returning, uh, that we would just burn this whole planet down uh, just for mankind to be more comfortable. And still, yet, yeah, we think we're so great. Anyway, um, if we remember that everything in life comes from our great creator, um, then instead of being lifted up with pride, then we'll look at these things that our hands have made, and we can actually be filled with humility and gratefulness should make us so grateful to God for giving us these opportunities that he has. So yeah, we can say, yeah, we worked on this or we did this, but we can't create something from nothing like God can. And that's something we're not to forget. He is the ultimate creator, um, but he allows us to work with him. And that's pretty awesome. Well, let's get back on this, uh, this topic of grace. And, um, you know, many in traditional Christianity like to teach that Grace is free, and that it's a gift that keeps on giving. There's no requirements, just giving for giving. And they like to say that obedience is not needed, but we know that's completely false. God will absolutely not keep giving his favor and his spirit if we do not strive to live as he has commanded. And who are we to think that we can just pick and choose the laws of God that we want to obey? The example we saw a minute ago about Apollos and Paul working together with God shows the hierarchy of our relationship. Uh, the next examples we're going to look at also, uh, they also reiterate that hierarchy, but it, they also show how God works to mold us. We'll see that the work is from both our sides and that it's based on a relationship. And God does not work by just giving grace freely to us without us making efforts to change. So let's have a look here. Let's turn over to uh, John 15. And we're going to look at uh, starting in verse 1. That's John 15 and verse 1. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I am him, bears much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. So I like these examples a lot that uh, deal with fruit and gardening. And it's so nice to be able to, if you, if you have that opportunity, to be able to, to go outside and to pick fruit off the tree. Uh, I don't know why, but it's very exciting. And you, know, you get to look around, you get to search for the good pieces, uh, the ones that are ripe. And uh, it feels good when you're able to find them and, and when you I don't know. It's different than if when you go into the supermarket, there's something about uh, picking it straight off the tree. And I imagine God feels like that too, um, but that, that he has that type of excitement uh, when, when he sees a fruit in our lives. But, you know, that, that's a much more rewarding, I'm sure, than, you know, picking up a physical, of a physical fruit. But in the scripture, it clearly says that, that we are the branches and we are supposed to bear fruit. In other words, God has requirements for these branches which is there to bear fruit. And if you don't bear fruit, then he cuts you off from the vine. And you know, if we have a tree and it doesn't bear fruit, 
we would do the same. I mean, who wants to have a branch that has no purpose, no use? If that's the case, then it's just there um, needlessly sucking nutrients, sucking water, and then taking away from the other branches, not allowing them to make you know, really big, nice, juicy fruits. So this is clear. It shows that God expects results. And the more results we can achieve, the more God will continue to work with us. It says that every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. So this is showing, you know, he goes and he cuts back a little bit every time after it fruits so that it can encourage more fruit to bear. This is very um, much similar to the scripture that we read about uh, growing in grace. And as the vine dresser, God multiplies his favor. He gives, it, uh, he gives us more help. And it's a type of compound interest, if you will. He invests in us, just like if you prune a tree, that's an investment in your time and your energy. And you hope to be repaid with that compound interest when you later go back and you pick the fruit. Uh, that's the part where the excitement comes from to a certain extent, because you're reaping the reward um, from what you did before, your investment. And the same thing happens with God and, and us. So we have seen that we can receive God's favor, but to continue receiving it, there's work on our side um, that's needed. So now let's take another look at this question that we saw in the Old Testament, where I was asking, uh, if I have found favor in your sight, or if I have found favor in your eyes. And what they're really asking basically is, if I have pleased you, then please you know, do this for me. So the question that we should ask ourselves is, how do we please God? So let's turn over to John, or sorry, 1 John 3 and verse 22. I'll have a look here. I'll look at a few scriptures about um, what it says about pleasing God. So that's 1 John 3 and verse 22. It says, And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So right now, we're at the Feast of Tabernacles, and we're commanded to be here. So in that sense, we are keeping God's commandment, and that's pleasing to him. Um, but of course, there's many other ways, uh, a lot of other commandments and many other things uh, that God looks for in, in obeying him. Um, so let's look at another verse here. Uh, we'll skip down to uh, yeah the next one. Uh, just go to verse 23. It says, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Joshua Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So first, what does it mean to believe on the name of Joshua Christ? Uh, it's spoken often in the New Testament about believing in his name. Is it just to believe that a person with this name existed? No, not at all. Um, those names are important. They have meaning. We are to believe in the meaning that is behind them because that tells part of God's plan. Joshua means God saves, and Christ means the anointed one. Uh, it doesn't state in the third name here um, in this verse, but we know that the third one is also referred to as Emmanuel, which means God is with us. If you take all three of these names, uh, it tells us a great deal of what uh, uh, what the role of God's son is and why he was sent. So if you put it all together, you could say he is the anointed one to be king. and He was sent to save us by allowing for God to live in us. So that's pretty incredible if you just look at that right there. It tells the whole story. And it's pretty crazy when the, the world does not grasp what his true purpose was and, and why he even came. And it's all summed up in these names. But, uh, you know, uh, we, of course, know that they haven't been given the opportunities and their eyes haven't been opened yet. So we are commanded to believe on the name, the actual purpose and the process, the, the meaning behind his name. And if we don't, then it's not possible for us to properly love one another with agape. We don't have God's love unless we have God living in us. And that's the only way that we can even be able to keep the commandment that Christ gave us, that we are to love one another. Again, if we obey God and live as he has instructed us, then we will please him. Let's turn over to um, Colossians 1. 
Now check out Colossians 1 and verse 10. That's Colossians 1 and verse 10. It says, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Um, this scripture again illustrates a process of growing closer to God. As time goes by, we are expected to bear fruit, and with that, also to become wiser. Um, as we move away from sin, away from our carnal pools, away from Satan's influence, our minds and thoughts begin to become more like God's. And as a result, we should have more fruit. Uh, God continues to prune back the vine after we bear the fruit. You know, he tests us. And that gives us something more to overcome. And it gives us the possibility to bear even more and more fruit. The cycle keeps going. In short, we can say that God is pleased whenever we make efforts to live his way of life. He wants to see us overcome. He made us carnal, and he made us an enemy against him. Holy, righteous character has to be developed. He essentially put us into these human bodies so that we would have to fight. That's why it talks about putting on the whole armor of Christ, because what God has given us through Christ is the complete battle kit, so to say. Uh, the whole system of baptism and having the laying on of hands and receiving of God's spirit is what guides us and helps us to develop God's ways. And like it says, uh, his ways can then become our ways. Let's turn over now to, uh, to Hebrews for a moment. And we'll look at another scripture that speaks about uh, pleasing God. I'm going to look at Hebrews 11 and verse 6. That's Hebrews 11 and verse 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who, dil who diligently seek him. So if we are looking to please God and to be rewarded by him, in other words, uh, to receive of his grace, of his favor, um, then we are told that we must have faith and seek him. In fact, it states that without faith, it's impossible to please him. So let's go a little bit deeper into this topic. Faith is another one of those words that to me is, is similar to grace in the sense that it's been totally twisted by the world and, and distorted. And if we're not careful, you know, some of these wrong ideas can hurt us because they're just used in such a fake, syrupy way. Well, let's look at the word faith, for example. Um, in Greek, the word faith is called um, pistis. And if we were to translate that word into English, you know, probably trust and belief would be the closest words. However, there are lots of small meanings that can be wrapped into the word. And this is essentially true because of how the word was used in everyday life. Um, here's just a short list of words that kind of wrap up um, some of the meanings and nuances it has. Uh, so we have trust, trustworthiness, honest, credibility, faithfulness, uh, good faith, competence, assurance, pledge, guarantee, credit, proof, credence, belief, legal trust, protection, security, and I could keep going on and on. In Latin, uh, the word for faith is fide, and it has the exact same meaning um, as it does in Greek. And the only reason why I bring this up is because we've probably all heard of this, uh, uh, of something being described as uh, bona fide or bona fide. And in that sense, um, it's actually meaning good faith. Um, and we use it today to describe something as being original. Um, you know, it's the real deal. It's authentic. So whenever somebody is using that term, they're trying to express that you can trust it because it's true. In everyday terms, um, faith was used in any kind of transaction between people. It's basically, you know, legal mumbo jumble uh, that people use to form a relationship and safeguard themselves from getting burned. Um, from that's where we get, you know, such legal instruments that we know today as trusts. Uh, we still use all of these same legal terms today even. 
And each party of a commercial transaction has to perform certain actions at certain times in, in a process. It can be as simple as I pay you first and then you deliver a product to me. But it can also be much more complicated. If there's a lot of money involved, then maybe you get a middleman type of escrow um, for handling payments. Or maybe there are portions that are paid for portions of work that are completed. Um, and if someone doesn't perform what is expected, then the trust or faith is destroyed. So if you were to deliver, let's say, 25% of the work, and then you don't receive 25% of the payment that you had agreed on beforehand, then your complete transaction would have a breakdown. You wouldn't be able to go any farther with it. And then you'd have complete chaos. And that's why we have these types of legal systems we have today, because it's hard to trust people, and especially when money's involved. So uh, trust and money, they really go hand in hand. And just look at, uh, look at our money in the US, the greenback, you know? It says on it, and God we trust, which is actually pretty funny because um, we see that the world actually does not put their trust in God whatsoever, especially when it comes to the financial system. Um, our whole system is based on credit chains. Uh, one person will, or one institution will give credit to another one, and then that one will give credit to another one, and then to another one, and then at some point then someone's probably investing it into the stock market to go back and then pay money back to another one, and then that one pays money to another one further down the chain. And so if there's ever a breakdown in this chain, then the whole system can fall apart. Now, the world trusts the system. Um, that's what they put their faith into. But it's such a fragile system, um, and God's not involved with it. Although at some time, times here, he might be actually holding it up because it's like a house of cards just waiting to fall. And he's just holding it up uh, until it's his timing to let it go. But this system, it keeps growing and it keeps growing. It's really amazing to see. Um, but we know that it can't be trusted. And you would think, didn't 2008 prove that? But instead, people keep putting their trust into it. And that's also why they're always speaking of confidence in the markets, because without confidence, then the whole system will break down. Everyone must keep believing in it. There has to be that faith in it. Um, keep belie believing that the, the good times won't end. But if somebody thinks for an instance that they're not gonna get their money returned in this long line of, of credit chains, then they're gonna stop giving it out. You know, That's what happens when, you know, there's ever any ever any issues? Uh, then the first things you know the banks do is they stop lending out money, and everyone tries to gather up their money and they try to get it out of everywhere that they have it stashed and all these different institutions. Um, but we know that that ship is going to be sinking soon, and we know that uh, they're all going to be grasping for whatever they can when it goes down. But you know, faith, as we've seen here, it's it's really based on trust. And in a relationship um, with trust, there are expectations. No commercial transaction is based on people just believing that they aren't going to get ripped off. Um, just believing you're not going to get ripped off is not going to protect you. Um, so there must be proofs, and people must demonstrate that they can be trusted. So that there tells us that faith is something that must be demonstrated um, in this relationship. And like I, I mentioned a minute ago, um, if you complete 25% of a large project and that person doesn't pay you um, the agreed upon 25%, um, then you know, that payment is their demonstration of trust. And if you don't get it, then how can you trust that person to pay you anything more once any more work is complete? So the transaction uh, would break down right away and, and that would be the end of it, no trust and the deal is off. So how do we demonstrate our faith? Well, there's one main step that everyone in God's church must first take to demonstrate our willingness to live God's way of life. And that is baptism, of course. That is a physical thing that shows to God what we believe and that we want his way. We ask for forgiveness of our past sins and for their remission. That demonstrates our trust, our faith in him. 
That is one of the main ways that we can begin to receive God's favor, his grace, if you will. Um, when we come to that point, we are to bury our old selves and the way we were in the world, full of selfishness and captive to our own carnal ways. We are to come out of the watery grave a new person, then we're you know, to walk side by side with God. And last year at the feast, I spoke of the covenant contracts that God has made with mankind and his church. And baptism, in many ways, is our way of signing that contract with God. First, uh, God has to call us out of the world to offer us that contract. He offers us favor, grace, um, and that's not owed to us. To be called by God is to receive of his favor, and we don't receive it because we are somehow special. None of us deserve to be called. That is something we are to remember, and that should help, uh, help us to continue to have a, a humble spirit. And then, once we sign the contract, so to say, then we start this process of growing in God's ways and growing in our goal of becoming part of Elohim. And then God will continue to give us more favor, more grace, uh, so that we can continue to overcome. Uh, but we must seek him and ask him for the help, just as those in the Old Testament did. They went before God in a very humble manner, like when they asked for supplication and prayer. It is from a lowly level, looking up to God, uh, knowing that he is all-powerful and, and that we're weak, carnal beings. We are what we are, and we need his help. That type of spirit shows God what our heart is like. That is further demonstration to him about our character. So if he sees that, then he is more likely to answer our prayers and help us through whatever difficulties um, we are going through. Favor and grace will abound, as it says. If we do our part, then God will continue to pour out a spirit on us. It's pretty simple. Again, the, the world's view of faith is totally distorted. They don't understand. God has not called them and opened their eyes. So how can they understand? They aren't able to distinguish the context in which different apostles present the topic. If you were just to read over certain scriptures, it can be confusing. One area uh, seems to say that you're saved by faith and not by works. And then another area says that you're saved through faith and not of ourselves or by our works. Do these scriptures contradict each other? Well, hopefully we know that they don't, but let's go through a couple of them here um, so that we can make sure that we have a balanced understanding of the subject. Let's turn over to uh, Ephesians. I'm going to go to Ephesians 2 and verse 8. That's Ephesians 2 and verse 8. And it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So first, in this whole process, God must give us favor and call us out of the world. That is a gift that everyone in the church of God has received. What happens then once we have been given favor or grace, once after we've been called? Well, God opens our eyes and our ears. He gives us truth. And with that truth that God gives us, uh, we can then begin to trust him. In other words, have faith in him. If we trust God, then that also means we believe him. And then the scripture points out again that it is not because we are great. Uh, we can only have our eyes opened and, and our ears opened uh, once God has called us. We all sin, and we know that God cannot be around sin. So it is only by his power that he can and does call people out of this captivity. But there is a response that is needed so that grace and favor will abound. Because there are plenty of people who have been called throughout the years, and they have been able to plainly understand God's word. But many of them aren't able to make that leap forward and actually commit to this way of life. Maybe it's because of the pools of family members or friends, or maybe it's because they can't tell their boss that they won't work on, on the Sabbath. And if they don't commit and obey what God says, if they don't keep the holy days, if they don't give tithes, offerings, etc., then all of their new knowledge will slip away from their minds as quickly as it entered. That can happen as well after we've been baptized. If we 
stop keeping the Sabbath, for example, as we should, then God can take away his favor and he'll take away that spirit that he gives to us that helps us out in our lives. The same thing happens with tithing or any of the other com commandments that he's given us. And this should all be super basic to us. We should learn that right away after coming into God's church. And if we look at the scripture again, though, it says that by grace, we have been saved through faith and not of ourselves. And the world tries to manipulate the meaning of this by saying that because it's not of ourselves, that there's just nothing we can do. In other words, that grace is just given without the need of a response from our side. But that's not what it's saying here. What it is saying is that God's favor is what saves us. And that part is true. Um, it is God's spirit that allows us to be more like God. God gives us his mind and it is his and it's God's mind that actually saves us, not our carnal physical minds. And how do we receive of, of God's mind, of his favor to help guide us in life? From believing what God says and acting on that belief. And if you believe God, then you will obey him. Let's turn over to James. Let's turn over to James 2 and verse 14. That's James 2 and verse 14. It says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? So in the last verse we just read, um, and it said that it was by God's grace and his favor that we're able to be saved through grace, that grace is a gift. And that's true because he doesn't owe it to us. Uh, just because a child obeys a parent doesn't mean that the child deserves to be showered with presents uh, from the parents. Same thing here. But some in the world try to twist the meaning of that verse to say that we just have to believe that God and Christ exist and that that's how we can be saved. Because it does say it is not of works, but we know that that's not true. And we see that here in James, the question is being posed, can you have faith without works? He is asking, if someone says they have faith, in other words, uh, they say that they trust and believe in God, but then at the same time, they have no works, no fruit in their lives. If that's the case, then can just their trust or belief in God save them? He goes on. We'll see verse 15 here. He says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? This is a pretty funny example, um, because if somebody needs food and they need clothing uh, because they're naked, and you just go and tell them, Go in peace, uh, be filled and warmed uh, with clothes, um, well, you know, you're not actually helping them out too much there. Um, obviously, actions speak louder than words, and words alone here aren't going to fill their belly or keep them warm. Let's skip to uh, verse 17. Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Aha! So, very clear. You can say you believe all you want, but if your actions don't show that you actually believe, then your faith is dead. And why is it dead? Because if your actions don't demonstrate your trust or belief in God, then do you really believe him? Um, going back to that example earlier about the 25% payment, if you don't make that payment, then you are not demonstrating trust in your relationship of the transaction. And that's the whole point that's being made here. If you really have faith in God, then you will have a response and there will be action. And that action will produce fruit. Then you ask God for more favor and grace and he'll give it to you. And you get more understanding and you act on it and you produce more fruit in your life. And then the cycle keeps on going. Let's look at verse 18. It says, but, some, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith with my works. 
So he brings it home even, even stronger here, saying that his works show his faith. It is about action and, and not talk. It's sad how the world has totally messed with these ideas and how they just pick and choose scriptures to justify inaction. And as we've seen today, it's all about our relationship with God through Christ. It's not a, a one-way relationship. We are fellow workers, as it speaks about. And the Greek word for that, if you remember, is synergos. And that's, again, where our, um, our word synergy comes from. It's a perfect way of describing the, the kind of relationship that we do have. None of this is really new to us. Uh, we understand how this whole process works, um, how God does the calling, how that it's a gift, and it's a pearl of great price. And then to think of how we can go before God through Christ, who, who paid the ultimate price, and have the possibility to have a relationship that goes both ways, it's pretty amazing just to understand that fact alone. The world doesn't have faith in God, but they like to talk about it. When you look at what traditional Christianity believes, it's easy to see how Satan has made a, a concerted effort to hide the truth. This so-called faith uh, that people supposedly have does not demonstrate actual belief in God. Instead, it's just another emotion that you're supposed to work up by yourself, and um, it becomes a mystery to people, really. I mean, how do you work up this belief, this faith that you're supposed to have? And if you think about it, I mean, could traditional Christianity be any more confusing? Could the Three Musketeers Trinity be any more difficult to understand? I mean, when you admit that one of your, your biggest doctrines is a complete mystery and that it can't be understand, doesn't that scream out Babylon? Confusion? I, for one, can't wait till this type of confusion is dealt with in the world. As if it's not of the truth, then it's a lie, and it's confusing. And the convoluted ideas that exist out there just give me a headache. Um, yeah, Can you imagine believing in this kind of off-the-wall doctrine that the world believes in? How sad would that be, to live in such darkness? How thankful are we that we have been called out of all that? It should be really scary that, to think that by, through disobedience and not trusting in God, that, that we could even fall back into it. So we need to not forget that if we ever stop producing fruit, that our relationship with God will dry up. And the truth that we see is obvious now, it can slip away from us. Uh, just like what happens to those that are called and that when they don't actually make a, the leap forward. For a moment in time, they see God's truth, but after inaction on their part, it disappears. Uh, that favor is gone. Just like uh, they lose the truth, you know, so can we. And if you think about it, it's a little bit akin to suddenly losing lots of IQ points all of a sudden. Imagine that. Um, because if God's spirit leaves us and we can't see the truth, then we're basically becoming stupid. Seriously. Um, and, and that should be scary. And I don't think anybody wants to be, become more stupid. I sure don't, you know. Every year that goes by, I want to be less stupid than the year before. And, and that's a pretty good goal, I think. Uh, you think like uh, back 10, 20 years ago, well, I knew much less then than I, than I do now. And well, I know that I sure don't want to go back then. And I'm sure none of you want to go back there either. It's probably one of the only good things about aging is that uh, with time, you learn more than what you did before. But if you've been in the church for two years, five years, 10 years or more, uh, think of how much truth God has given you in that time. And you don't want to lose it. Instead, you want it to grow. And you want to, you know, increase in the knowledge of God, as we read earlier. Uh, that's what wisdom is about. So how thankful are we that we understand the truth? And even more so, how thankful are we that we're able to actually engage with God at this present moment and begin to have our minds cleaned and freed? Faith is not something that has to be worked up. That's a false Protestant idea. It's not about just believing. As we know, the demons and Satan also believe God, but that doesn't mean they have faith. It's not about blind faith either, or just believing for believing's sake, or as some in traditional Christianity also to speak of faith alone. No. That relationship that trust or faith is built on is based on actions. 
actions from God and actions from our side. Go back to the example about Apollos watering. That shows again how that process works. It's everyone working together. A synergy where compound interest is built up. Everyone does their smaller part to make something big and grand together. And then faith, as in your trust in God, should continue to grow in this process. God gives us truths that we didn't see before. We learn about his way of life. That's God's action in the relationship. He helps open our minds. We, on the other hand, see those truths, and that in return should allow us to trust God even more. It's a synergy in this relationship, and it's circular and continues to grow. In a nutshell, that's how faith should grow, uh, not some fake syrupy Protestant type of, of faith. So faith isn't just about saying you believe, it's about demonstrating that you believe. The old saying of actions speaking louder than words really applies here, because if you truly believe God and want his way of life, then you will show it in your actions. That's the fruit. Let's hop on to the topic uh, about faith in doctors or medication. You know, if you refuse to go to the doctor to get help from your, for yourself when you're sick, how are you demonstrating faith to God? How can you expect God to heal you when you're just sitting back and just believing that he will intervene? Tell me another example in life where God works like that. If you want a better job, you just sit on the, at home on the couch because you have a strong belief that God will give you something better. How does that fit into the example of Apollos watering? Did he say, I, Paul, planted, and Apollo sat there in the field, believing that God would send rain, just waiting? No, Apollos had to water. Does that mean Apollos didn't have faith that God would send the rains? Was Apollos in error because he watered? Now, it's a pretty good example, I think, because it you know, shows the foolishness of any such thinking about, about faith. We have been made phys physical, and we have this physical planet, you know, where we can learn from. How is doing whatever we need to do in a medical sense uh, for our benefit of our own health any different than that of eating good physical food? You know, you can have some small accident where your wrist gets cut, and if you don't wrap it, then you could easily bleed to death. So should you just work up some faith and believe that God is going to perform some miracle to close your wound? Or should you go and grab something and wrap it and stop the bleeding? So I hope no one would agree that it would be a lack of faith to stop the bleeding by wrapping it or putting it in a Band-Aid. And hopefully no one else is drawing a line somewhere else and, and saying, okay, well, uh, that would be fine to do. But going to a doctor because of some other ailment or getting some other kind of treatment is a lack of faith somehow, because that's not balanced. That doesn't come from the Bible. That's like the Jews who go off the wall and they start adding to the law things that were never put there in the first place, and then treating their little additions that are unbalanced, treating those as if they're like the real law. Now, that's not to say that if you were in an accident and in a coma, some type of a vegetative state that we need to go as far as to be hooked up to machines to, to keep us alive, or you know there are similar other circumstances that happen like that as well, but we need to have balance in this area, and going to doctors is definitely not demonstrating a lack of faith. But what are we told to do when we're sick? Well, we are told that we're to go to an, an elder for anointing, uh, doing that is a demonstration of our faith to God. And what does it mean to ask for anointing? Does it mean that we believe that God will heal us from whatever ails us? Well, we, we sure hope so because we don't like to suffer, but we know that God may or may not heal us from whatever we're suffering from. So how then do we demonstrate our faith? By asking for anointing. Well, it's demonstrated in the asking as we're told to do so. Uh, by doing so, we are being obedient to God. That is a signal from us to God that we trust in Him, no matter what the outcome may actually be. If we actually think that, then when, when we're asking for anointing, then that could be a real challenge for us. Maybe the, the biggest one of your life. 
you may be fully trusting God uh, that your life is in his hands, but it's not just your physical life. Uh, do we really think that God knows what's best for us? If you're faced with something very serious with your health, then that can be incredibly difficult to, to address. We just need to remember that when it comes to health and faith, that believing that our lives are in God's hands does not equate with the belief that God will grant us the gift of physical healing. And that applies first and foremost to asking for anointing and then by doing whatever we can in a physical sense to get back uh, to good health. Let's look again at Hebrews uh, 11 and verse 6. I know we already turned there, but I'd like to look there again real quickly. That's Hebrews 11 and verse 6. And it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Let's take notice of this word here um, that's used for believe. In Greek, that word is pisteo. And hopefully that sounds familiar if you were listening a little bit ago. Um, then um, you would know that the word for faith before was pistis. And so pisteo is just the um, verb uh, that is translated as faith in the same verses as before. So this is similar to what we looked at earlier too in the Old Testament with the word for grace as a noun and then also as a verb. So it's technically you know, being used twice here in this uh, verse, you could say. And here's one of the de definitions I found, and it is to believe, to put one's faith in, trust with an implication that action based on that trust may follow. So many times uh, the word believe when it's used in the New Testament is actually um, implicating uh, that there is an action based on that belief that will follow. How do we demonstrate our trust in God? Well, should be clear by now, it's by our actions. And if we truly believe God, we will have a response to what he gives us. Again, it's a two-way relationship of coworkers. We are to believe in God, not just have beliefs about God as the world does. And believing in God requires us to put on that whole armor of God and go into battle. We can then go before God in a humble spirit and ask him for more favor. Times we're about to go into, they're going to be tough, and they're going to be some of the most difficult that we've ever faced. And we need to make sure that we're close to God. Make sure that our relationship is stronger than ever, and we're going to need his favor more than we've ever needed it before. In closing here, let's look at a rather different use of the word faith as it was used here in the Old Testament. We're going to turn over to Exodus 17 and look at verse 8. It's Exodus 17 and verse 8. It says, uh, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur um, went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So this must have been quite a sight for the children of Israel. I can only imagine seeing that when Moses' hands were raised, um, that they're winning, and as soon as they came down, that they're losing. And it must have been something from a comedy, you know, to win something like that. So you, you can better believe that they were going to do anything that they could do to uh, make sure that his hands were staying up in the air. And Moses must have been really exhausted, too, if you think about it, even with the help from the others. Um, I don't know if you've ever done any of those types of exercises where they have you lift up an arm or lift up a leg. And, you know, for the first moment, you're like, <laughs> you know, that's easy. What kind of workout is this? Um, 
But then you get into it, and a minute later, you know, you're crying, and you're saying, get me out of this position. It's really like torture. But um, anyway, thankfully, Moses had some help here. So these guys were helping hold up his arms, and they even gave him a chair. So that was good for him. But surprisingly, here in, in the scripture, the word for faith is actually being used. Um, it's translated as steady. So in other words, Moses' hands were faithful and true, not wavering. Um, sometimes the, the word is even translated here as uh, steadfast. But um, besides just having his, his hands in the air, uh, Moses was holding his staff, and that was referred to as the rod of God. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read this to you real quick. Is what was mentioned in Exodus 4 and verse 17. And it says here that, um, And you shall take this rod in your hand, wherewith you shall do signs. And this is what God did every time with Moses. Uh, that rod or staff was always around. Earlier in chapter 9 here, um, he struck uh, the rock and water came out for the people to drink. Um, but he also used it, uh, he raised it for parting the Red Sea. And it was there at the burning bush. It was everywhere, basically. So uh, Moses was making sure that he had this rod with him. And that's why in verse 9, he was telling Joshua that tomorrow, when they would be fighting, that he would be on top of the hill um, with the rod in his hand. And this rod was used to show a proof that the power was coming from God and that he was working through Moses. And if you remember, uh, Moses was constantly working as a, as a middleman, so to say, between God and the Israelites. He was always saying, like, God, uh, these people, they're not listening to me and asking, you know, who do I tell them that sent me? And in other words, how do I get these people to believe? Um, so God was continuously performing uh, uh, different uh, miracles and, and signs there as a proof. And uh, the proof should have been enough, you would think, uh, to convince the Israelites about who God was and, and who Moses was. But as we know, uh, they still didn't believe. So if you think about it, this event with Moses holding his hands up uh, with a staff shows an interesting relationship between God, Moses, and the children of Israel. This is really a physical illustration of what faith is. Um, it's showing how Moses was working together with God and God was giving favor to the children of Israel to fight this physical battle. But Moses had to do his part. He had to keep those hands of his with the rod up in the air. And as soon as his, his hands would, would come down, yeah, so would God's favor and his grace. So his hands in the air, you could say, were a proof from the side of Moses. Um, and this action was, in many ways, a physical manifestation of his faith. So let's think about how this physical example uh, that we just saw here, how that can apply to our spiritual lives. Think about how we can demonstrate our faith to God and to do it in a steadfast manner, not wavering or faltering. And that means being steadfast in our relationship with God and know that if we do that, that God will pour out his favor and his, his grace on us, just as he did for Israel in this instance. And how much more does that mean to those of us now in the church than it did to those of physical Israel? Because the grace and favor that we can receive of now is so much more. It's a spiritual help that we can have in our lives directly from God. That is part of the armor of God that we can now partake in because the spiritual battle is so much more important. So in closing here, let's make sure we please God through faith, through trusting in Him. The biggest way we can do that is through obedience, because if we believe that God's way is the right and only true way, then we will want to have His way. Obeying God shouldn't mean that we have to do things that we don't really want to do, and we only do them because He says that we have to. We should be in agreement with everything in God's Word. Then, it shouldn't even be difficult, because our ways are continuing to become more like His ways. Let's take note whenever things get hectic in life and whenever drama creeps in. And if our relationships are ever struggling, then we need to get them sorted out right away. Do not let any of these complications in, in your relationships fester because they'll spread like a cancer. And, you know, I'll give an example here. You know, my, my wife and I, when we first got married, 
uh, we made an agreement that we would never go to bed without settling a disagreement or an argument that we had had. We did that precisely for that reason, because bad feelings and resentment complicate things and can make small problems grow into large problems. We should have a similar way of behaving, though, with any relationship that we have, especially those in God's church, and especially here at the feast. We need to get to the bottom of any problems that we have and solve them. That way, we can continue to walk side by side. In the end, God's law is about agape love. It is about our relationship. So let's strive to work on our relationship to this feast. You know, we've had a difficult time this past year and a half with COVID, and in many cases, we've been physically separated. Let this feast be the time for you to work on your relationship. Don't quench that river, and let's allow God to do his work in us. Support one another, like Aaron and Hur did uh, as they supported Moses. But instead of physically, we can do that through God's love, through agape. And let's be steadfast in our faith this coming year so that God can continue to grant us more favor so that grace and peace can multiply. Because going into the future, we're really going to need it more than ever.